Welcome to Africa to you. I'm Vivian Birchall, your host. In this episode, we'll highlight the history of science and technology in Africa. Indigenous knowledge has been and still is the key to the survival of African societies. It is supplemented with modern formal knowledge. Societies throughout Sub-Saharan Africa have preserved knowledge about the past through verbal, visual and written art forms and that is why Africa has the oldest record of human technological achievement. Today I'll talk about the components of this knowledge and how it has influenced the world we live in. Let's reflect on science and technology in sub-Saharan African culture. The history of science and technology in Africa has received relatively little attention compared to the regions of the world. Despite notable discovery of significant ancient African contributions in mathematics, metallurgy, architecture, medicine, surgery, and other fields. Did you know the oldest stone tools in the world have been found in, the, in Eastern Africa and evidence for tool production has been found across Sub-Saharan Africa. Tools were made with what was available where they lived. Some of these stone tools have existed for centuries after the interaction with the Europeans and some communities have continued to use them. I have childhood memories of watching my family in southwestern Uganda using a grinding stone called orvengo to make millet and sorghum flour for home consumption. Many tribes in sub-Saharan Africa used the grinding stone. Medicine. Africans have for thousands of years had wide knowledge of medicinal plants that are still in use, especially in areas that do not have access to modern health facilities. As indigenous sun people can identify 200 species of plants by age 12. It is common to see multi-purpose plants grown in the yard and around the home in African homes. For example, my mother's house, she planted alvera, banana trees, omjaja, whose botanical name is Osimum gratissima. Some refer to it as Osimum suave wild. Omjaja is used as a tea spice, um, which we call chai, a word that is very common among the Bantu tribes in Uganda. The plant is also medicinal and is used to help with flatulence, which we call Oktumbula murubutu, or one could say gas in the elementary canal. It, is also, it also helps with constipation, which we call obteavia, and toothache. For treatment of various traumatic wounds in Sub-Saharan Africa, plant juices with antiseptic properties were squeezed into the open wound by a traditional physician. A red-hot metal tip was used to cauterize bleeding points and burn away damaged tissue. The wound edges were closed with a tough thorn, an owl, and fibrous suture, and a fiber mat was wrapped tightly around the wound to prevent bleeding. The caesarean section way of giving birth was not introduced to Africa by the Europeans. It was the other way around. 
European travelers in the Great Lakes region of Africa, Uganda and Rwanda in particular, during the 19th century, observed caesarean sections being performed on a regular basis. The expectant mother was normally anesthetized with banana wine and herbal mixtures were used to encourage the healing. From the well-developed nature of the procedures employed, European observers concluded that they had been employed for some time. According to Horacean history, this is an eyewitness account by a missionary doctor named Falcon of a caesarean section performed by a Manyoro surgeon in Uganda in 1879. The Manyoro are a tribe in western Uganda. The patient of about 20 years of age and she lay on an inclined bed, the head of which rested against the side of the heart. She was half intoxicated with banana wine, was quite naked, and was tied down to the bed by hands of the back cloth over the thorax and thighs. Her ankles were held by a man, while another man stood on the right side, steadying her abdomen. The surgeon was standing on the left side holding the knife aloft and muttering an incantation. He then washed his hands and the patient's abdomen first with banana wine and then water. The surgeon made a quick cut upward from just above the pubis to just below the umbilicus, severing the whole abdomen, abdominal wall in uterus so that amniotic fluid escaped. Some bleeding points in the abdominal wall were touched with red hot iron. The surgeon completed the uterine incision, the assistant helping by holding up the sides of the abdominal wall with his hands and hooking two fingers into the uterus. The child was removed, the cord cut, and the child was handed to an assistant. Amazing, isn't it? The report goes on to say that the surgeon squeezed the uterus until it contracted dilated the cervix from inside with his fingers to allow postpartum blood to escape, remove clothes and the placenta from the uterus, and then sparingly used hot red irons to seal the bleeding points. A porous mat was tightly secured around the wound and the patient turned over to the edge of the bed to permit drainage of any remaining fluid. The peritoneum the abdominal wall and the skin were approximated back together and secured with seven sharp spikes. A root paste was applied over the wound and the bandage of cloth was tightly wrapped around it. Within six days, all the spikes were removed. Falcon observed the patient for all 11 days and when he left, mother and child were alive and well. The patient recovered well and Falcon concluded that this technique was well developed and had clearly been employed for a long time. Similar reports come from Rwanda where botanical preparations were also used to anesthetize the patient and promote wound healing. This is the Africa that we rarely hear about. Here's some more. Maasai surgeons were known to successfully treat pleurisy and pneumonitis by creating a partial collapse of the lung by drilling holes into the chest of the sufferer. Egyptians had a thousand of years of experience of dissecting and bandaging mummies and this could have had beneficial lessons on surgical technique. These practices of medical practitioners Opening up various parts of the body gave them extensive knowledge on the anatomy of the human body. Most of the Africans had indigenous quarantine systems to fight contagious diseases. Let us reflect upon Africa's contribution to mathematics. All of the mathematical learning of the Islamic world during the medieval period was available and advanced by Timbuktu scholars. This included arithmetic, algebra, geometry, and trigonometry. The oldest mathematical tools, Ishingo and Labombo, were discovered in Uganda and Swaziland, respectively. 
The Ishanga bone is a bone tool dated to the Upper Paleolithic era. It is a dark brown length of bone, the fibula of a baboon, with a sharp piece of quartz affixed to one end, perhaps for engraving. According to research, some say that the Ishango bone is the oldest table of prime numbers. The bone is reported to be located on the 19th floor of the Royal Institute for Natural Sciences of Belgium in Brussels and can only be seen on special demand. It is also reported that this bone has a series of notches carved in groups and that the notches appear to be much more than a simple tally. According to Wikipedia, the markings on a row A and B each add to 60. Row B, which contains the prime numbers between 10 and 20, row A is quite consistent with numeration system based on 10. Since the notches are grouped as 20 plus 1, 20 minus 1, 10 plus 1, and 10 minus 1. Finally, row C seems to illustrate for the method of duplication, multiplication by 2, used more recently in Egyptian multiplication. Recent studies with microscopes illustrate more markings and it is now understood the bone is also a lunar phase counter. Like I mentioned again in my intro, the theory is that it could have been invented by a woman to track her cycles, which would also run with the theory that women were the first mathematician. This is a topic for another time. While reading about the bone, I came across yet another theory on Planet Quest website, and I quote, astronomical significance. If these arrangements are not coincidences and the mathematical interpretation is correct, then the Ishango bone clearly has little to do with astronomy. However, an alternative explanation was put forward by Alexander Mashak in 1965. Noticing sudden patterns among the notches, Mashak claimed that the markings are a sort of lunar calendar a record of the changing phase of the moon. Mashak's idea has yet to be proved or disproved. If it is correct, the Ishango bone is suddenly a contender for the oldest written astronomical record. But would it definitely be the oldest? Not necessarily. So, who knows what they were tracking? One thing is for certain. Whatever it is, our African ancestors were tracking. They invented a mathematical tool to do so. And that influenced how our societies counted and tracked different things. There is evidence that historically communities in Africa have engaged in creative and innovative practices to mitigate the day-to-day -day challenges faced on the continent. But these innovations have not received the global recognition they deserve. For more about Africa and the African diaspora, Visit africatu.org or send me an email at africatu.vivian at gmail.com. Thank you for watching Africa to You. Till next time. <laughs>